Good evening and welcome to our fifth episode of BSBI's Café Artistique. Uh, I'm here today in the uh, famous Gasberg Hotel with three guests. Um, to my left, uh, Alisa Turk. Uh, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Thank um, you for Alisa. having me here. <laughs> Alisa is an entrepreneur and a consultant regarding um, regarding digitization, sustainability, and uh, how agencies basically can uh, become better at what they do. Exactly. Um, <laughs> with us tonight is as well Kimberly Uton, a former colleague of mine, uh, creative strategist and still copywriter. Every once in a while, but <laughs> every more once strategy. in a while. <laughs> uh, for Anthony, a um, creative agency in Berlin with famous um, clients like Mercedes Benz. Katja's Vodafone, Vodafone yeah. Bet1 and uh, Lidl. Lidl, Aldi. right. Quite, quite new, Aldi. right? Aldi. Aldi, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. We'll cut that part <laughs> out. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, uh, Zagi Hartov, uh, 
famous musician and CEO of uh, BSVI and uh, Gas Germany. Yeah. Um, welcome tonight. Thank you very much. Um, so our um, topic for tonight is creativity, um, troublemaker and fuel for growth. Right. Um, and before we dive, uh, dive into this um, topic, I just want to give you the opportunity to tell a bit about your journey, your professional journey until now. Where do you come from? What's your background? What are your passions? Alisa. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> well, I started my journey 22 years ago in the digital area. Um, or we, s we talked before about <laughs> the past, uh, the 20 years before I was playing piano, but then mm -hmm. <laughs> after studying, I uh, went to the media industry, to the agency industry, and started there in a digital business um, for a very long time. But then I switched um, sides and um, focused on consulting companies in digitalization, um, becoming entrepreneur, we investing in companies mm -hmm. and startups. Um, like influencer marketing platforms or other platforms, so more tech companies. But we also founded um, an organization um, to avoid ocean plastic, which is really important. So um, since my son was born, um, and I think this is also my purpose or has become uh, one of my purposes, is um, that we see that we don't have any time, that we need to act now, that we need to change things and this is what I'm doing all the time. So I'm um, helping companies in the change process, focusing on digitalization, but in the last five years also on sustainability and mm -hmm. this is what's my real purpose. So we, um, we are helping, educating companies, people, management, um, advisory boards, um, especially how to become more sustainable, um, how to um, take the whole um, em employers with you on this road, <laughs> on this journey, because it's not only implementing a strategy and that's it. It's really a change process. You need to have new mindsets. You need to have a new kind of failure culture. You need to be more open to collaborate, etc. So it's, uh, I could <laughs> um, talk cool. for hours yeah. about Ooh, that. We'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is, that's what I'm doing. and. Um, now all companies that we are consulting are from all industries. It's um, stock listed uh, or smaller agencies or um, mid-sized companies. So everyone who wants to become more digital or sustainable is uh, highly welcome, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> all right, interesting. Yeah. And I think that uh, digitization and sustainability kind of yeah, go together at a certain point. It's a kind of... Um, new one it's a kind of trend well i would not say that sustainability is a trend but it's uh, it's a must uh, have but it's um, always about changing companies changing business models and changing the culture in a company mm -hmm. and this is i think um, the, the main thing that's common in both topics i see yeah Okay, thanks for this introduction. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kimberly, we already had you on uh, Café Artistique, but uh, we'll come back. <laughs> and um, can you again uh, kind of give us a, a idea of your professional journey until where you know it's also yeah. kind of um, unique? Yeah. Unique, <laughs> random, I don't know, how, however unique, you want to put it. Unique, for me, yeah. it, it all made sense. But yeah, thanks for having me back again. Um, I enjoyed myself last time. And um, uh, yeah, I'm glad to be, um, to be back, uh, to be an alum of the uh, Cafe Artistique, so to speak. So yeah, I um, have been uh, working, I mean, working, I guess, a pro for almost 20 years, I guess you could say. and. Uh, I started out, um, you know, in life. I think when you when you go to college and you uh, pick out subjects to study, there are some people who say, "I definitely want to pursue a particular career. Therefore, I'm going to study something along that journey that will get me there." 
or I'm going to study something that I think is really, really interesting and um, then see what happens. And mm -hmm. so that's always kind of been my motto in life, to do what I think is most interesting and then to see where that takes me. <laughs> so um, you could call that uh, irresponsible or adventurous or, like you said, unique or random. Uh, but I first uh, started out um, actually yeah, studying um, uh, German literature, language, and history in the U.S., which is actually somewhat uncommon now these days, um, and then that brought me then to uh, Germany after that. But in the US, I was working as a, as a reporter. Um, I've always done something with language, communication, and um, advertising or media. So my very first job was working as a, as a reporter, um, both for online uh, outlets, but uh, actually primarily for radio, when people listened to radio. Back they then. still do. Yeah, <laughs> they still do, uh, even though people uh, don't really want to believe that. Um, but that was actually before the era of, of podcasts. and. I was actually working at a station uh, at that time when the station was actually becoming more digitalized, when radio stations realized they had to have websites and you know, put, their, um, put their content online to be heard later, et cetera. So I was actually part of that, that transformation. Um, then after that, I worked as a teacher, as a translator, and then a copywriter, and uh, uh, as a translator and copywriter for agencies, um, for international brands, and then just got into the advertising agency after that. Um, worked as a copywriter, worked my way up to creative director, was a creative director for a total of, I think, six or seven years. Um, somewhere in there, I felt like you know advertising just isn't for me, and had a short um, but very, um, yeah, meaningful existential crisis where I said, okay, no more advertising ever again. I'm going to go study, um, do a master's. So I did a master's in um, uh, international business and uh, legal studies. And then after that, I went back into advertising, um, uh, worked creatively, and then uh, about a year ago, I uh, decided I wanted to work more strategically. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if we want to later, we can talk a little bit more about the structure of an advertising agency, what, it, what the departments are inside of that, that might be interesting for the students. But mm -hmm. I was working as a, as a creative and, and just really enjoyed seeing uh, what the different parts are that have to come together and sort of help, I really enjoyed help, helping orchestrate um, you know, the client's wishes, um, our creative goals, and um, bringing those things together uh, so that all of what we do really has a purpose. And so that kind of led me naturally to, um, uh, to switch from the creative department into the str uh, strategic department. And that's where I've been officially um, for uh, about a year, but mentally for more years than just one. And um, right, um, after we worked together at my previous agency, I, I uh, I joined an agency, as you, as you mentioned, uh, called Antony in Berlin, um, and we work for um, some very interesting clients, and I focus on Mercedes-Benz there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so quite an interesting journey there, and you, you mentioned business studies, which is a perfect lead to, to Zagi. Um, most of the viewers might know you as the CEO from BSBI, or now CEO from Gas Germany, um, but there's like a backstory to you that uh, many might not know and I said famous musician because pieces that you um, performed are famous or that you wrote. Um, so tell us about your journey. How, how was your journey? How did Zagi become the Zagi that he is today? Uh -huh. So it, uh, it's a kind of a journey that I never planned. Um, when I was really young, uh, I had this uh, passion after listening to Mitislav Ostropovich, who was for me the idol, a very famous Russian cellist. And after listening to him playing uh, when I was really young and listening, I was inspired by the instrument. Yeah. It looked difficult, so I was even more excited to want to play that instrument. And uh, for, for it, it viewers, what instrument was it? Cello. <laughs> so uh, as a cellist. And then I started, like everyone else, trying my luck and performing and, and it was a very hard journey mm -hmm. because uh, learning to play an instrument is one thing, but coming from a family which uh, did not have the musical background uh, demand uh, lots of trust and belief and as such you had to win uh, scholarships to, for someone to pay for it and it was very expensive. Sometimes family gave, uh, my grandmother and, and uh, others tried to support, but it, it was really hard. So uh, going with my mom to the cello lessons and traveling all the time and then going to schools and all of it was uh, challenging. And I think part of this challenge 
helped me later on who I became. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Then uh, winning competitions, performing in front of people, making money out of art. That sounds really bad, isn't it? <laughs> Today, if you're saying it, people think that it's wrong. But you had to make a living, so mm -hmm. you need to make art. If it is uh, happy uh, events, you need to make people giggle and smile. If it's sad events, you need to see how you can make them uh, be more emotional and cry. So you, you learn how to win audiences to get more gigs, to get more invitations for concerts. And you had to have a communication with your audiences. And I think all of that, and later on, of course, being in the army in the string quartet and then studying in university like Royal Academy of Music, becoming a teacher and all of that, brought me to be very focused on one thing. Later on, because I would jump, otherwise it's a long story short, uh, I became a cultural attaché of my country in the United Kingdom, at a very mm -hmm. early age, 24. Oh, wow. And uh, before and I even taught at the academy, the junior academy of the Royal Academy of Music. And then, I, first time in my life, I understood music, cello is great, classical music, all of that, but there is a big word called art. And it's much bigger than I thought. I was sure that my world was the biggest. And then I realized as a culture to share that mm. there is a massive world out there and I need to support it. Mm -hmm. And I cannot only support myself. The me, me, gone. And you know, every artist, I'm sure uh, some of you knows, is all about themselves. And the whole world is run about them. And I had to take this artist of myself, put him aside on that chair, and say, now you need to support some other mm -hmm. artists. You cannot support yourself because of the position. And I learned how to uh, create 100 events a year, working with mayors of London at the time, Kent Livingston, following by Boris Johnson, doing other events uh, with charities, organizations. And I got fascinated about the whole uh, things. And later on, uh, creating a cultural center of Europe after I finished the work at the embassy, meeting there who became my future wife uh, and, and working in a charity and how hard it is to work with artists and a charity at the same time. No money, because no money. No money, no money, exactly. <laughs> they cannot sponsor for the beautiful venue. You cannot give really money because you need the audience to come. So you learn how to make money from nothing. Mm. And it was a challenge because we had to create over 100 events a year for no money Which and unique one events. One event every three, month, uh, every three days, basically. Yes. Yes, like and doing days. everything by ourselves, yeah. from putting the chairs down, preparing the food, doing the cashier, then preparing everything after, making sure, by the way, in the middle, mm -hmm. sound the system, even coming up with the ideas. So I met a, the most amazing artists I could ever meet in my life, mm -hmm. you know, from East and West and cross cultures and everything, from theater, from poetry, from music, everything, visual arts, all of that. And that's obviously was continuing to a way when one day, a very good old friend said to me, what are you doing? Why you will not come and work in our institution? We have a very successful business school. Come and, uh, and join. And I said, but I don't have passion for business school. I want to create, if at all, arts. So he said, so come and create an art school. And uh, I come in, and of course, you cannot create an art school in one second. So I, uh, first of all, start with the arts enterprise diploma. Crazy idea, but when I started my studies, my higher education, I went to Yale, and, and there there was a guitarist giving uh, classes about career. And obviously I wasn't inspired by that, unfortunately. But I thought, these artists don't know how to promote themselves. They don't know how to understand IP. They don't understand legal contracts. They don't understand how to do budgeting. They don't understand how to basically do anything apart what they've been taught all their lives. So I will create a mini MBA, basically, with different subjects, and will take the most famous or successful people in the industry. So I went to Uri Geller. I went to uh, top galleries in London. I went for the Musician Union in London. And I went to every different site. And I asked, let's ask you legal questions, uh, marketing questions, um, intellectual property, uh, financials questions, how to do things. And each one I asked the same question. And they came up with the answers completely almost different, but very spiritual. And on that, we added the content of an academic content mm -hmm. to it. And this was a, a program that we gave to the Queen Award 
uh, of enterprise, which coincidentally, together of course with a bigger application, won the Queen Award for uh, Enterprise. And in that moment came to me the vice rector, James Kekwad, and he says, Sagi, now is the time to create a school. So I, I remember the Bauhaus, talking about Germany, where we are. Mm -hmm. And Bauhaus had something very interesting. He could have studied different uh, things within the arts industry. But everyone who graduated Bauhaus, you would recognize them. They have something in common. So I said, OK, body and mind. So people said to me, what does it mean, body and mind? It's a body to be able to present yourself, to talk in front of people, to stand on the stage. You know, as a musician, you need to have kind of physical ability to stand there and be able to maintain yourself and your ability. And mind is how to combine this with the coordination, with the uh, um, marketing and ability. So bring these two elements on top of the core element of your study, photography, music, whatever you study. And then all our students will have these two, the entrepreneur as well as the ability. And that start the creating of London College of Contemporary Arts, which exists till today with the so LCCA. many thousands of students, LCCA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And later on, uh, one day I got an invitation, come to Germany. This is a long short sto uh, story, lo uh, short. Germany was never famous for higher education in English language. You would come here for medical, for engineering, for other things, but not for higher education in English. And definitely 10 years ago, no one thought to come as an international student to Germany. And that's something really specific you wanted to do here. So a few years ago when I was told, OK, we have an opportunity to open something in Berlin. Would you want to participate? And I said, no. <laughs> so <laughs> they said, OK, maybe one of your fashion or arts and design, come, try. And I remember uh, our CEO and, co and the founder of the group, Aaron Ettingen, who is also a very close friend, said to me, Sagi, just come and let's see what we can do. And I went to Berlin and I saw a campus and I thought, should we, should we not? And then we came up with a new idea. Why to be partner of, let's create our own school. And at that time, there was a lot of sp uh, skeptical. Can we really create something from scratch in Germany? We never done it. We've done it in England, but never in Germany. How will it work? Do we understand the rules and regulation and all of it? And I found it like music. How to search. You know, when you take a new piece, you search about the composer. You search about the, uh, the time. You search about all the uh, um, aspect of how to perform it. The same with uh, business school. Who is the industry? What would you, uh, how would you support your students? Mm -hmm. To think from the student's point of view, not just from the business. Because every business school can teach MBA, but you need to be unique one or, or different how to teach it. And then we created the Berlin School of Business and Innovation, which again came up with the, the same idea. It's not just a business school. Is the Bauhaus of the business school. That was my idea. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, when in LCC I said, mm -hmm making art work, which means for artists, when they graduate, they can make money, not to go mommy and daddy again. In business, I said the art, the art of business. Yeah. <laughs> that was an idea. So I immediately came up innovation, enterprise, and, and, and leadership. And I said, I want every single one of my students to be able to do an elevator pitch, to have to, to uh, focus on career, as well as being successful in their studies, and for us to guide them. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy to share here that from nine students, we have more than 4,000 students that have been with us. A thousand and something graduated already. And this, uh, now we are over 3,000 students. And it's, it's quite an amazing journey within mm -hmm. such a short time. And Absolutely. that was the kind of thing inspiration yeah. come from music. Because mm -hmm. the music gave the ability to think, I can do it. You know, with regardless all the challenges, like as a young uh, musician going to the cello lesson, performing in front of strangers, trying to make money or earning scholarship, by p or even getting a cello as a lifetime gift that I received two times in my life, you have to survive. Yeah. And creating a, something for others is always harder than creating mm -hmm. it for yourself. So that was some of the challenges that I found and was very inspiring for me. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Thanks for these insights. I, I didn't know. I learned a yeah. lot uh, today. Um, 
talking about challenges and, and, and growth, um, I have a question to you. What do you think that uh, young creatives need to grow? Uh, what can we do? What can they do to, to really grow? We've heard like from, from the academic side, basically, what, what uh, academics can do. What, but what do you think can they do or we do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few things come to mind. Um, mm. And uh, you, with your experience as a young creative, <laughs> you can <laughs> add, of course, um, uh, if I'm missing something. But yeah, I think the journey um, is is uh, determined, you know, by uh, you know two factors: the intrinsic and the extrinsic factors. Mm -hmm. You know, I think as a creative, you really have to be you have to be passionate about what you do. You have to believe about believe in uh, what you do, and I think. Most of the young creatives and the, the creatives who have stayed in the industry for a long time really just can't imagine themselves doing any other job. They might have tried out a few things here and there, but they just don't, they just realize that they don't fit in anywhere else in the world except in the creative profession. And, and I like think- Things around that, right? Exactly, and I think, um, I think uh, uh, people who have, people, I think young, young people, um, they stick with it and they'll pursue their passion and they may not really realize that yet about themselves, that this is sort of like the space in the world that you know, is best for them. Um, but um, I think that's one thing. So you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's that, I mean, passion is kind of a generic answer, but it goes, I think that's, that's an added dimension uh, to passion. And the other thing is, um, I think also uh, something that uh, Zagi touched upon is that um, you know, if you're a musician, um, you, know, you have to practice every day. Um, and I think that's true if you're in any realm of art, um, whether you're a classical musician, a jazz musician, a graphics designer, whether you're a copywriter, whether you want to write a book, you know, there are so many different drafts that you have to go through before you have the final one. And there are so many different, <laughs> pain. you know, and you have to, you really have to enjoy that process. You know, mm -hmm. if you, if you don't enjoy that process, then you really should find, find something else, you know, and that's, you know that's a part of the intrinsic motivation that you that you have to have um and um you most most creatives that i've worked with um even even when i remember when i worked as a as a as a creative in in the agency environment even when things were done more or less mm -hmm. you were never satisfied with what you what you gave to the client or what you presented to the others and the week <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> You know, you want that tomorrow, no way, I, you know, maybe next month, you know, because of everything that you want to put into it, you know, and it's good to, you know, identify with your work. Mm -hmm. But then I think also as you mature, then you also have to understand, you know, where, where you end and your work begins, because that's also, I think a, uh, it's important to have sort of a healthy relationship to your mm -hmm. work, because if you identify too closely with your work, then um, that can also, um, that can also, you know, lead to some problems or just to some frustration that's not necessarily um, and if you if something is criticized that you take it too personally and, and think it's a personal failure maybe even right yeah Where it's just the client didn't like it it has nothing to do with you it's just their it, taste yeah, yeah exactly and you d sometimes you don't know where that feedback comes from mm. yeah and that's also you know where sort of like you know subjective with objective comes together it's important to balance those two things and I think because you asked what you guys can do, I think um, uh, you know, helping people understand you know where they end as a person and where their be their their work begins, sort of as an object, possibly as a living object, that thing, that product is allowed to be interpreted by other people, you know, mm -hmm. and you have to understand, you have to find your way of dealing with that interpretation and with that feedback from you know the the outer world, and so I think mentoring is is a really important part of. Uh, uh, growing up as a as a creative and becoming a creative, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think also you, you know you, uh, you can probably add to this as well. You know, musicians when they grow up, you know, they they want to study with a particular teacher, sure. and um, in the creative world, you know, you the creative director that you have um, is also someone who um, has an important impact on your career and your professors before that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think um, what's important as a, as a mentor, whether you're someone's boss or their professor, I think it's, it's, it's important you know, to, um, to um, push people, but also um, uh, let them have uh, you know, the freedom that they need to really pursue the ideas that, that they have. Um, let them define their own goals. 
but also be very um, honest about the feedback. Mm -hmm. um, if something can be better, then tell them that because I, what I have experienced um, with the younger people that I work with, the younger people, with young I mean um, creatives or non-creatives um, in the agency environment up to the ages of 27, 28, that's, that's who I'll consider young, you know, for today's, for today's oh, purposes. Yeah. <laughs> um, they're all incredibly hungry. Um, and often when I delegate something, um, they surprise me. Um, and they come back with something where if I had uh, been, uh, uh, you know, more concrete about a particular goal or what the benchmark is, I probably would have held them back. Mm -hmm. But basically, you know, helping them understand what is the, what is the problem, what is the challenge, what are the per parameters, and then, of course, preparing things in a way that is suitable for their current level is also important. But then after that, just sort of like giving them the freedom to sort of pursue the answers or the creative solutions that they think are, 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 um, are right um, is the best thing to do. And then to just guide that really only when necessary. Um, and like I said, like I've been, I've been really surprised and impressed by you know, the, the, you know, the 20 year olds that I'm working with uh, mm -hmm. these days. And um, they are very, very, grateful for critique and mentoring they're really hungry for mentoring um and yeah i guess that's in general mm -hmm. you know the advice i would offer on that yeah i think there were a couple of really interesting points where i thought yeah uh, like critique is is also an art just saying i don't like it helps no one right i don't like it because of well this and that is kind of i it's kind of annoying or too much um, so people need to understand or to learn how to critique and also um, what you said to to not give too uh, tight rules basically because otherwise you will just end up with the same shit as yeah. every time again mm -hmm. again again right um, and you are consulting <laughs> agencies and what do you think uh, is something that, that businesses or agencies can do to help young people, creatives, strive and, and kind of unfold their full potential and what it should uh, agencies, businesses care for and look for in those young people? What are, like? Well, the, I think, well, I'm, I'm a digital um, nerd, so <laughs> when, <right>. when, when <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, um, whenever I'm working with agencies, I'm trying to um, break down the barriers for digitalization, for mm -hmm. technologies, for data, for things like that, because it's not part of the creative work. So you are more um, building creative work and art and so on, and that's, in that case, it's not nothing to do with digital tools or data, um, AI or whatever. Um, but if, if I think the younger ones, especially your students, they are maybe more open than the creative directors or mm. the managing directors of the agencies that I'm at, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest. And uh, I think the work is to first convince the management of these agencies to become more digital and to be more open to just talk to Facebook, Instagram, TikTok and whatever and to use it because if you if you are not used to how does it feel to to behave in TikTok for example you cannot do any creative art work mm -hmm. uh, for a TikTok campaign for mm -hmm. example so um, all students need to um, yeah be creative and uh, and and test for 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 themselves first but also for their clients um, or projects um, how does that feel these new technologies and so don't be shy mm -hmm. <laughs> be open just invite experts they all love to talk to creative agencies because this is what um, we will always need also in 20 years or in 100 years when we have AI and data-based uh, technologies and whatever, um, you always need the basic creative idea. And mm -hmm. this kind of big idea uh, will not come out from an AI. They will only um, use what is already existing. Mm -hmm. And they may combine that in a very intelligent way. But uh, whenever, and I think this, this is already 
happening in in the mu in music as well. So that there are some experiments if an AI could create a new piece, um, of, music. piece of music, yeah. mm. but it's not really surprising. So it's always okay. It's nice, but it's not surprising. Like I think echoing existing. Yeah, things. and this is what mm. what I think creatives should. Uh, people should really do they should surprise people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and create new things and I think this is what I would um, give as a feedback or mm -hmm. as a challenge to all uh, agencies mm -hmm. try new things and um, especially the young ones they they are hungry as you mm -hmm. mentioned they are hungry for these kind of tools and just let let them do these things because they they are maybe more native in these mm. tools and technologies. So listen to the young. Of course, they, they should listen so. and they should not be shy to ask if if they could help maybe the older ones mm -hmm. to show them how TikTok or whatever and Twitch is working because there are uh, some some kind of experts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, in, in all agencies. Yeah. And I think this is um, like super useful to, to like combine old creative knowledge, like experience with these new insights. And of course, like if I've been in advertising or in the creative field for 20 years, I have knowledge, I have experience, but I might not have knowledge about this new technology and how it works. Mm -hmm. And there I need these young people that tell me this is how it works, this is how it's perceived and how to use it. And then with my experience, I can help uh, basically to, to pamper the idea, to make it bigger, to, to, to make it round and, and impactful and, and think larger or to um, push those young people so go further, think about that in this direction. Mm -hmm. right. and, and, and I also would uh, tell your students, just be bold and try these things and also show these things to your mm -hmm clients or whatever where you're working in uh, what kind of environment or um, to your boss because um, they would never maybe um, give you the briefing to do so because they don't know how to brief <laughs> 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 to write a briefing that's, that's right, um, yeah. <laughs> but if you would take the first step um, maybe that could be the uh, a nice journey also for for the leader uh, leaderships mm -hmm. as well because it's a new kind of leadership not to um, work or give um, top down, yeah, top yeah. down <laughs> um, uh, briefings, but to listen to uh, to have a conversation, mm -hmm. of course, yeah. like we do yeah. today. <laughs> um, Zagi, in your um, journey as a as a creative and then CEO, um, do you think like I'm just having in mind our troublemaker part of this uh, today? Do you think that the youth has changed? Are they more troublesome or making more trouble today? Are they more willing to change things? Or wow. Well, I look at my kids. Mm -hmm. But they're very young. But they're very troublemakers, but they're amazing. <laughs> and uh, I think young people now think that they know everything. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, the reason for that because they're exposed for so many things that we were not exposed. So when I was uh, in university, only then I heard that there is an email structure and you need now to use it. So you can imagine how old I am, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to have it first time in a university, you know. <laughs> and I said, what is this email? Why do I need to use something electronic? There are pigeonholes in my university and I love the pigeonhole because I can go and take all the messages I need from my pigeonhole. So, you know, and, and now these days they, they're copying faster what you've been doing. And they and they are really uh, kind of I, I wouldn't say troublemaker, but they are really smart mm -hmm. because they find ways how to do it faster and easier. It's so annoying. they become a bit lazier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. And 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 in a way, th this you see it in everything in music, in in education, in everything else, because uh, many of them coming up with a lot of a creative way, mm -hmm. how to plagiarize, how to. Uh, find shortcuts, how to find excuses, because they've been uh, observing. And they're also learning us better. They know that we have a big heart, or we want really to see them successful. So we, they know we will give them a second, third chance. Mm -hmm. So I think at the end of the day, I don't see uh, bosses and other people seeing someone young or junior and saying, hey, 
I, I will basically push him down. No, they really want young talent to strive because they know, I mean, the smartest one at least knows that if you have really talented and creative and entrepreneurial people around you, you yourself will flourish too. So they push you up too. And uh, as long as people think it now minded, like in the past, that they were too scared that someone will come and overtake them or anything like that, they are the usually ones that usually block the company or the environment for progressing. And they also uh, sooner or later exposing themselves for mistakes. So I wouldn't call them troublemaker, but I was saying very smart beast mm -hmm. who knows how to make things a bit faster than we used to. But uh, sometimes they should still learn because you know what, we used to do it more manually and they do it more automated. So I think in that way we are a little bit still a better generation on that way. But what we have done all these years, they are able to do it much faster and we should understand that. And sometimes we should let them, as you said very rightly so, Elvis, that we should let them flourish. Uh, not always the boss need to look top down. Sometimes they don't even have the time to look. <laughs> and that's the biggest problem yeah. in today's world. The time is so short and we are packing ourselves with zillions of emails. And instead of allowing ourselves to be creative or to really uh, bring our businesses to the next level, we are so deep every day on operational things. And I, I found this that young generation are still inspired by things where we we were inspired by them and now we think oh now we need to do the other things and that's the only sad story because mm -hmm. when we get the opportunity to be inspired I think many of us can bring many amazing things but we're burying ourselves every day into the normal task so those people look to us like troublemaker because they're too creative or too <laughs> inspired and two things and they're less focus on mm -hmm. what we call normal, they call it boring. Yes. <laughs> and, and that's why we become boring a little yeah. bit. Maybe me, not the <laughs> least, but maybe we become boring. Yes, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, and do you think that um, this new behavior of, of Gen Z uh, mm -hmm. has Gen a lot Z, to yeah. do with uh, like the opportunity to access information like at your Press thumb, at your yeah. finger, like at an instant, where we had to search go to libraries and so on? What, what do you think that this, is this a kind of motor, an engine? That the accessibility? Of, yeah, of information makes them more yeah, question things. Yeah, I think accessibility is, uh, is, is one thing. Um, I think, uh, uh, I mean, I think there are, uh, you know, a couple different things at play. I mean, I think, you know, if you think about, I don't know, maybe if we think about ourselves, you know, when we were like 19, 20, 21, I think if I think about what I, how I was like at that age, I think what I really wanted was freedom. I wanted to find my way in the old world, in the, in the, in the world. I wanted independence. I wanted to find my pathway. I wanted to get from A to B. Mm -hmm. I wanted to meet up with friends. Uh, I wanted to meet new people. And these are the goals that you have in life. And I think, I think that the, the yeah, of course the accessibility, you know, it helps you do that to an more, even more amplified mm -hmm. uh, degree than, let's say, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and I think the access, uh, you know, the access to, te to technology sort of, uh, I mean, it amplifies sort of that, that, that spirit, I think, that we all had at, mm -hmm. at that age. Um, and, you know, f for us, you know, meeting new people, um, buying new clothes, uh, you know, having an awesome dinner, you know, going for drinks. I mean, in that age, it's a matter of survival, mm -hmm. you know, and y you have to have it, you know, and getting from a, you know, getting what you want, um, you know, you're, if, if, at that age, or I mean, even at later ages, you know, it's it, the, the biggest, um, the biggest um, advantage is adaptability, mm -hmm. you know, like that's, it, it, it's, it's a fact of nature. Um, we say this about brands as well, you know, um, change or die. Right. I mean, that's obviously, a, you know, a, an exaggerated way of saying it. But, you know, adaptability is a huge, a huge um, uh, advantage. And that's what I'm seeing, you know, among Gen Z. Um, they're very adaptable, very inclusive, very open to mm -hmm. trying new things. 
but they also don't think in in silos you know the way you know companies are were 20 years ago and the way companies still are today for example you know i think the one thing that holds back um, uh, companies or the brands that i work for for example are their internal structures mm -hmm. you know and um, <laughs> because there's no connection or any time to re to you know to have an exchange with someone from a different discipline who has that information and that energy and that curiosity and that knowledge um, that you need, um, um, you know, to maybe uh, push something forward, or, or that person might have, you know, the experience or the insight or the creativity that you have to offer. And I think that's so interesting that, um, you know, we want to, you know, go back to Gen Z, talk about them, how they are. I think that's so interesting that they don't, they don't think that for them, for them, there's no difference between analog and digital. Mm -hmm. There's no difference between social media and and paid display. There's no difference for them between, you know, a blog and a banner. There's no difference for them, you know, between like you know, a film and, um, and uh, it, it, you know, going to the cinema, Netflixing, or, you know, having a wonderful evening with friends where, you know, someone, you know, shares like a really interesting narrative about their, about their day or their life or something like that, you know, and I think that is, I think that is really very promising because I think this sort of, um, you know, like, uh, yeah, this kind of like culture and this thinking that really is without silos, it's without borders, it's very community driven as mm -hmm. well. I mean, if we look at, you know, the younger generation, you know, today, um, I think um, they, they're much more, or, yeah, they're much more community driven. They're much more interested in finding their kind of like tribe, connecting with other tribes, so to speak. And I think as they grow older, my hope, um, and I'm actually quite convinced that that will change the corporate structures that we have today and that will change the way a lot of things are done, mm -hmm. you know, the way brands are built and, and managed, the way politics runs. You know, I'm very happy for Gen Z to, you know, take over actually quite soon, to be honest, yeah. <laughs> because they're also Please. very interested in, yeah. in, you know, in, in tackling some of the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, tackling biggest challenges. Alisa, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> like um, sustainability. Like yeah. sustainability, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, like Gen Z is like, we did our part about Gen Z that that's a, a core thing, right? Sustainability, the, the our nature or the um, destruction of it. Um, how do you think um, that creatives maybe contribute to a solution or maybe even like the opposite? How, how should, should we approach that? Um. I think we we need creative solutions, and that mm. has nothing to do with art in, in general. But we need to have creative solutions to cope with these issues that mm -hmm. we have today. So we need to be creative, and this is not about creative people. So all business people, all everybody needs to be more creative to solve the problems that we have and that we are running in. So this is this is maybe the first <laughs> one. Mm -hmm. And um, talking to your students, I think it's, um, sustainability is really a huge topic because it's not only about climate change and, um, and water protection, it's also about diversity, it's about um, um, health and so on. So it's, it's a very huge topic. And I think it, the first one is that each student should be really well educated about these topics mm -hmm. to know how to handle them in their creative work because you need to make sure that you have, a, for example, um, what creative work is something that is communicating with other people and you will have a kind of impact in whatever way you are, mm -hmm. you are um, expressing your thoughts. And if you have, for example, um, not a diverse mindset and if you're not thinking in um, nature loving uh, environmental uh, things then your work will not be maybe um, the one that will be bought in future so mm. i think you need to have this this kind of education first and of course you need to be creative because we were talking before about yeah. um, creative design for example or product design so whenever you are starting to create a new brand, a new product, you not only need to uh, think about does it look nice and <laughs> um, does, it, does people like this kind of brand or product, you also need to think one step further, 
Is it recyclable? And uh, what kind of material are we using for that? Is it recycled material? Can we reuse it? Is it part of the circular economy? So these are things that you should also have in mind before starting to work. And um, of course, it does make things easier. <laughs> um, but yeah. I think you can really um, be more creative in another way, of course. Uh, but you need to find solutions that are maybe not existing today. Mm -hmm. So you could be part of the solution for tomorrow. Right? So a real problem solver in, in, in a sense and inventor. Yes, 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 oh, definitely, right. definitely. Um, so, well, so basically one of our um, missions would be to educate them and to, to encourage them to educate themselves because there are mm -hmm. a lot of uh, new technologies, a lot of new things out there. And you mentioned just before this uh, live stream that uh, there are even uh, thought experiments about uh, banning um, ad ads or commercials for non-sustainable um, brands. Uh, so this will be a huge challenge for creatives as well, for brands and creatives, and exactly, uh, yeah. for us to to also educate them about these issues, right? Not to let them go into the ad industry and don't tell them about it that this might be a real thing that they have yeah. to to think about uh well your ad or your commercial that you just thought of or the product uh you might run into problems out there right um and you mentioned this discussion this is uh, already going around and there is um one initiative here in, in germany and they are really discussing about should we ban this kind of non-sustainable products mm -hmm. um, well, we are not allowed to do, but maybe there are some politi uh, um, policies in future mm -hmm. that are banning that. Like we, we talked about uh, smoking cigarettes <laughs> is uh, banned in, in the advertising industry. And uh, of course, the creative people were finding new ways to cope with that. But maybe there will be um, uh, products that are full with sugar or not uh, good for your health um, that should be banned from my personal mm -hmm. opinion as well and um, or that are not working um, uh, in, in, a, in the supply chain um, if, if they are still using or, or um, using palm oil I don't know the yeah. <laughs> palm oil okay for example yeah. um, you, you should stop this right and um, of course there is another thing that I think will change. We will have now this kind of um, digital out of home, for example, or out of home places in general um, that are purely built <laughs> to show uh, advertisements. In future, there, there will be first another, um, yeah, yeah these, these kind of places will not be to show uh, advertisement in the first thing, but they are more like green places or mm. Uh, air filters or what kind of uh, or like charging stations mm -hmm. to uh, give something back to the people and only in the second line it's only also showing an advertisement mm. yeah, <laughs> and I think this is a kind of change um, in my opinion advertisement will also change and will more and more become a kind of enabler why not thinking about um, paying um, the, the, the bill for electricity because it's rising up. Uh, mm -hmm. If you would do that and you would be free to communicate with the people, it's a kind of advertisement, but in a totally different way. But you mm -hmm. are becoming an enabler. So it's not about, only, uh, not about only paying a bill, but to enable people to do things that they would love to do and they're not able to do now. Um, mm -hmm. it's co also could be like driving a car, uh, listening to music or whatever. Um, you're doing or having a smartphone. I think in the US there are already existing um, business models to uh, have a fully advertisement paid um, uh, smartphone contract, for mm. example. So, But it's always become more creative mm -hmm. <laughs> and find uh, solutions that fits to the current situation of uh, or issues that we will have and we'll, we will ha definitely have more issues in, in the future. Yeah, they, they, they won't. Um, there won't be less. Yeah. No. Sure. <laughs> um, and in, in your experience, do you um, kind of um, face a lot of uh, uh, back backflow from from uh, 
CEOs and, and, and managing directors if you address those topics like sustainability in an agency well, you know, or a company? Um, uh, there are two kind of people, ones that are really sustainable driven, mm -hmm. that really want to change the world and the, their business and the people they are working with, and the other ones that are um, forced to do so because of the capital market, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a good thing that uh, you are rated, uh, downrated if you are not sustainable enough. Mm. Uh, you are not getting any money from the bank if you are not sustainable in future. And so there are those two <laughs> kind of people yeah. that we are consulting, uh, the ones that really want to become more uh, sustainable and they're already uh, personally sustainable, but they don't um, know how to um, drive the change in, the, in their company. And the other ones that are forced to do so, but they know that they need to do so, uh, otherwise they don't have any future. Yeah, so like grinding their teeth a bit when they, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and for instance, if you really bluntly, we as a university, how we can, what would you like suggest to us how to improve? I think it's or always starting it with education. Mm -hmm. So if you would have uh, well-educated people around the world, mm -hmm. um, we would, would have that kind of problems. Yeah. <laughs> Like, do you think that this might be a kind of a, a new program to have people graduating that are like sustainability consultants? Do you think there's a business model behind that? Might be. We we started thinking on the direction of sustainability too late. That's the feeling I have, and uh, now we we trying to make students as well as staff being much more aware. And uh, I think students themselves are within art, definitely, because they know how to recycle things. So mm -hmm. uh, creative people learn very fast to recycle and reuse, but for different reasons, sometimes financial reasons and others. So, <laughs> so I wouldn't call it sustainable uh, driven, but uh, financial mm -hmm. have no choice. Uh, but w when we are now purchasing certain things, we, we, we really think mm -hmm. about uh, mm -hmm. the environment and we think, how we can use things that are really friendly and they are sustainable. Um, we create, we, we change with education. Mm -hmm. You know, there were certain programs a few years ago you would not think of, mm -hmm. and now they're coming. For example, supply chain. Mm -hmm. For example, um, uh, energy is uh, becoming even more. Um, th there, are, there are programs that added as we go because the the industry need people with those knowledges mm -hmm. you know a few years ago we were talking about marketing and other things there, there were a, a way how to talk to the consumer and the consumer journey so now you know people thinking do you really have enough uh, staff who graduate graphic design who have idea about consumer journey of ux ui so uh, within the, the education, education is very agile. It, it's moved to the direction where the industry will actually demand it. And then people say, hey, we have a lot of need for X, Y, Z. We need people in it. And in Germany, the system is really good because <laughs> Germany came up with this called Duale. Yeah, and Duale is one of the things I always very proud to, <laughs> to mention because yeah. in the UK we tried to copy this with apprenticeships and we did really in personally a very bad way. Uh, maybe we're getting better now, but at the beginning it was nobody knew what it is going to be and how it is. But via Duale we allow people who are studying and want an academic would also to have the professional woods. And then they are uh, gaining both abilities at the same time. So I, I definitely see that anything related to sustainability for innovation, mm -hmm. technology now that is very much booming and everything else, um, happening and more and more qualifications are created. A part of my job as a GAS uh, Global University System CEO, I have universities under my supervision, so the University of Europe. And, and we now have to create the more courses which related to uh, IT, for, um, uh, like we said, uh, supply chain, for energy, 
for uh, uh, medical uh, health care mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the industry changed. Uh, when a uh, few years ago business studies, pure business studies and pure art studies were very cool, now students are demanding more. <laughs> and you cannot just uh, like some of the public, this is the so plus the about makers. private. Yes, <laughs> they want, uh, they demand from you content mm -hmm. and courses that they want. And if you are not fast enough to adjust and mm -hmm. to recreate, you are behind. And mm -hmm. many institutions, public institutions, couldn't cope with this speed. Mm -hmm. The same is with online and hybrid. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. So, uh, we have a generation now that after they uh, already been so adaptable for uh, electronic uh, devices and also for social media, being on force on social media for two and a half years, go and take them out of their couch and bring them to university. <laughs> it's not possible. <laughs> they don't want to. They want a little bit. I mean, at the beginning they complained. You know, we should deduct the tuition fee a little bit because they didn't have that experience. But now when it, everything is open, they don't want to come. <laughs> and the reason for that, because they want this freedom. They want to do things. They feel that they are more efficient from, uh, you know, some distance, but also some work they want to do together. Mm -hmm. and, and this kind of uh, ability to create this combination, and you said before something about this combination, it's very important. Because otherwise, if you don't understand your uh, consumer, if you don't understand their needs, it will be very hard for anything, for artists, for education, or for every industry. So also with sustainability. It, in the past it was very expensive for recycling products. And now it's becoming a bit more affordable and people are much more aware and they participate. The past people didn't participate, you would have everything. Germany, again, Germany, <laughs> Australia, Canada, there are some countries who are leading the world in this. And unfortunately some countries are much in back end. Mm -hmm. But at the end, the whole world needs to move to that direction to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's true. Yeah. But that's education the is a good tool. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that's the thing. We, ha we are an international university. So it's you not saw today, university. these guys, I mean, I walked in, 12 uh, students are continuing to the next uh, stage of their life of their bachelors. And there are, what, 11, uh, 8, 9 nationalities? So the Brazilians were the one uh, on top because there are two uh, out <laughs> of that class. So uh, it was really imp impressive. And when you see where they're coming from, everywhere, Azerbaijan, Brazil, uh, Bangladesh, Egypt, uh, Iran, Iran uh, so, so many countries, Turkey. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And you're saying to yourself, hey, you know, they probably thought 10 years ago that we never have this kind of uh, meeting with mm -hmm. Germans also teaching them, you know, that, that would <laughs> never happen. <laughs> and now suddenly they are all in one uh, group and they are progressing. And seeing now the new students coming, which is about 70 new students, because this is really almost a mini startup, the creative <laughs> industry, they, they will even be exposed more. And that's the difficult in, in, in today's life. How do you, uh, uh, you know, deliver the message? not just for younger generation, but also for so many nationalities and uh, cultural mm -hmm. differences. Mm -hmm. that there is a direction that the world needs to go to. Mm -hmm. And not always you win, as you probably very know, but at least you can show that what you're doing actually support, and then they will mm -hmm. follow. Yeah. So I think the, it is moving there, but perhaps not in a fast step, baby steps a little mm -hmm. bit. But the, the good thing is with the Gen Z um, that they are so connected that then it's easier to convey you the You can message. influence faster. Yeah. Because the social media is, is so strong mm. uh, that you can influence faster, but you cannot force. So yeah. if they don't believe in it, mm. you will not... Uh, yeah, and they, and they, are, um, they question things quite, quite heavily, like Gen Z, they're not yes. just taking it and swallowing the pill. No, it's like they don't. Why? Mm. <laughs> they, they, they do question. They should be called Generation Y. Yeah. But yeah, they, they are not, not easy to, to convince they don't They take walk it. into a CEO room in, in uh, more daring than you would do mm -hmm. many years ago. I remember looking at my principal at the university, the, the vice chancellor room or the you know, his area, and I would walk really fast, <laughs> just not to be questioned. Yeah. So, uh, and now they're walking there, and they're looking, and perhaps you have some time. 
I would like to ask you something, and, and I would like to suggest something. And you know what? It's really daring. And I'm looking even at my eight years old son. He has so much chuspa, meaning, uh, you know, <laughs> this ability to come and stand in front of older and really smart people and, and, and question them mm -hmm. and challenging them. And I'm saying in one sense, you know, I'm very proud because perhaps this is the way, I, because the world today is much more aggressive and much more competitive, mm -hmm. that if you don't do it in an early age, you will never probably be able to be successful. Mm -hmm. But not everyone are able to, to do it. And, and it's maybe education is not just anymore to teach because you can learn on YouTube. But education can guide. And mm -hmm. I think this is the, the beautiful thing mm -hmm. about education. Yes. You said you go for the professor that you wanted to go as mm -hmm. a musician, mm -hmm. for example. That's true. Mentoring. Mm -hmm. Mentoring. Mm -hmm. I went to the one that I thought will be the mentoring because I liked mm -hmm. what I saw from other musicians that went to him and his mm -hmm. ideas and abilities. And I think this generation today cannot really access those mentoring because they're so busy. Yeah, they are role models, but they are extremely busy. So what they do, they're going to things that uh, they found that it's challenging or subject that they are interested or the uh, elements of the ability, like the, the condition are suitable for them. So they are a different consumer altogether to what we thought. If you contact them fast within 24 hours, if you're offering them things that they are <laughs> feeling this suitable for my lifestyle, mm -hmm. they will approach you back. Mm -hmm. But if you're just saying, hey, I'm here, you are there, I'm going to teach you and be your God, and you just go and obey and listen, that kind of teaching, unfortunately, non-exists anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you can, uh, you, you touched upon this like in, 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 in business life, like in general, that this doesn't work like the, the top-down uh, um, bossing, not leadership, but bossing. It's more than eye level now, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's more eye level, and it's um, also because um, you know I think the circumstances we live in demand it. You know, no one mm -hmm. person has the uh, answer anymore, and you know, with the you know the I guess you know we keep talking about the young people like we're so old, <laughs> but um, you know if we talk about the the let's say those colleagues of ours who are yeah. not yet thirty. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 um, Guess our age, you know, yeah. via this comment. <laughs> um, uh, are you under 30? I'm sorry. I, I, I wish. Maybe in my soul, but yeah. not physically, no more, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they have so many ideas. Hmm. And, um, and it's, I mean, it, the tables have also been turned as well because uh, so many companies, yeah. especially agencies, are looking, you know, they're searching, you know, almost desperately for, you know, people who are creative, people who are hungry, people who are passionate, people who have ideas, mm. people who want to, um, you know, really contribute, you know. So if, uh, you know, it, every company, you know, especially agencies, you need that type of person to survive, mm -hmm. um, and you would be silly to create circumstances in which that type of person does not thrive. Mm. So you have to. I talked about the, you know, the under thirty generation being being um, our under 30 colleagues being uh, community driven. That's really how they are. And you need to create a, a culture within your agency that um, or within your organization that allows for um, those type that type of community or, you know, for a community to exist. Mm. Um, and it's so interesting. You were talking about, um, uh, you know, facing uh, or creating um, a, a positive uh, culture of, of failure, you know, making it OK to to uh, make mistakes and learn from them. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like, um, you know, the Generation Z, for example, they're, they're not worried about doing the right thing. They're worried about, you know, will I have the chance to try something out? And yeah, contribution um, is, is yeah, important, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, it's, you, you would mm -hmm. talk to, you know, let's say for, you know, management level who's, you know, with maybe like 20 or 30 years of, of, of of experience and you'll talk to them about you know creating the right failure culture and um, you can use that word and they'll understand that but younger people who are just starting out they have no idea what you're talking about because they don't know what it means mm -hmm. to worry about not doing the right thing hmm. you know and and um, that's um, so yeah I think it's just so so interesting and you know when we talk about Gen Z you know when, when we talk about you know where they want to work or the type of brands that they buy they really are. They they are attracted, and they they mag, they they are, yeah. They're attracted to 
those organizations and those brands, the, anything in their life, it has to align with their values. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't do that, then they they move on, or they silently quit, you yeah. know, or they, <laughs> you know, or they just, or they, you know, you, they uh, ghost you. They move on. They, you know, they just. I mean, they're just. That's yeah. how they are. And yeah. you have to create an, an environment that that, you know, that, you know, that where they want to be, and that's something very new, I think, for employers. Some mm -hmm. are catching on. Some are not. Um, but even as we face a recession and, uh, you know, even as, uh, you know, unemployment is high and inflation is increasing, um, the unemployment, sorry, is not, you know, a, a problem in every industry right now, but um, um, even uh, as we, um, you know, face these sorts of, um, you know, challenges, um, it's it's um, you know the agency you know you have you have to almost feel honored like if uh, you know Je if someone from Gen Z wants to come and work for you and stay you know you have to understand yeah, <laughs> these days and stay mm. right and, stay, yeah. Um, and it's um, yeah very much at eye level mm. yeah and um, they are way more critical than we are or were at, at that age right um, like making a decision to to work somewhere or to to buy a brand um, and do you have the experience that brands really care about that? Or companies? Um, yeah, they, they definitely do. Um, so there, there are several topics or yeah issues that they need to handle. So the one is purpose, of course. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, <laughs> I like the, the uh, generation Y <laughs> 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 because it's another um, meaning. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm talking a lot with, with companies about that, their purpose and why, because they don't have this clear why. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't matter if it's a product, a company um, producing some, something, or is it, uh, if it's an agency. And mm -hmm. I think, especially as agencies, they don't have a clear why and purpose. And we have seen that in, during the um, COVID pandemic, that a lot of people were um, like, they, they, they changed uh, their jobs because uh, in the in the end it doesn't matter if you are sitting in front of the computer um, doing the same things for agency A or B mm. um, because there was no purpose <laughs> you, we were uh, working for for the clients maybe but not for the agency and mm -hmm. um, when it comes to brands I think they are all thinking about how to challenge that um, but they are it's it's really a hard way because they need to they have their running business mm -hmm. and they're earning still a lot of money <laughs> with that business and they need to change and this changing process is really critical because mm -hmm. they need to uh, define the new brand or the new why and purpose um, but the the business potential for this new products are maybe still small because for example sustainability is maybe a topic that we are already discussing a lot but Since people <laughs> yeah but people well we we have had a, a small phase where we discussed that a lot it was uh, uh, after COVID started and then there was like COVID is kind of gone um, uh, and then it was okay we have this climate thing um, but now nobody is talking about that mm -hmm. topic anymore though we have laws that uh, will force companies to mm -hmm. do so and I think there are so many challenges not only sustainability but there are so many challenges that people don't know how to handle that mm -hmm. um, like energy costs are rising up the the employee costs are rising up so everything is the, we have a really um, issue with this inflation and we don't know how to handle that mm -hmm. because we haven't learned to do so and yeah, I think that's that's a hard way, and I think there will be a lot of companies that were not so health healthy in the past that are uh, will go bankrupt. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting phase, maybe a, a kind of consolidation. This whole fashion industry, for example, it's a mess. How many um, um, yeah emissions they are causing. <laughs> It's really a mess, yeah. and we, we really don't know uh, how to handle that. And I think the, the whole fashion industry and the brands there, they 
um, will face a really um, tough future, I mm -hmm. would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> In a positive true. way. I think there yeah. is only a, a, a small future for only few brands mm -hmm. in that I mean, because industry. a lot of them got big being fast fashion brands, exactly. which is challenged now, like heavily. Um, yeah. and, and coming back to, to young creative people, do you think that uh, some brands are not um, daring enough? Like in, in change proces processes, you need uh, like thought leaders, like people who, who really believe in the change that needs to be brought. And do you think some brands or, or companies are not daring enough to have young people being these thought leaders, but only have like their old people being those and, and not being a, a really uh, role model for young people? Yeah, I, I think there there are all big, bigger companies. Mm. They they really struggling with that because the younger people they may have the ideas, but they don't have the experience. And mm -hmm. I think it's a mixture of both. You need to have experience in uh, running a business. Um, though it would be an interesting experiment to have a, a under thirty CEO <laughs> for this kind of business mm -hmm. school. It, maybe not be the best idea because there is a missing experience in how to do this and how to do the financial things, the law things, etc. Mm. There are so many I mean uh, topics that need to... I mean, you face. don't have to have like one young CEO, you can have like one C-suit <laughs> yeah. somewhere uh, being accompanied exactly. by, by experienced people, right? But being daring enough to have... I mean, this will, this will cause some, some tribulation, right? If you have a large company, all 50 plus people, and then you have like 20 something rising up to sea level uh, mm -hmm. because of change. This Are is, afraid this of is that? one, and, and I think on the other side, um, what I'm, um, when I'm talking to companies or bigger companies, um, it's also good to have a kind of advisory board mm -hmm. uh, with, with the right people and the right experts. To be honest, at the moment it's still uh, not not where you should be. But if you have a really good advisory board uh, with a mixture of um, the generations that sustainability people, maybe digital experts, and whatever you need to drive your business, mm -hmm. and you're listening and talking to them, um, this could be a good way to do mm -hmm. so. Um, they don't need to run your business, but they could <laughs> advise you. And I mm -hmm. think this is how to again listen <laughs> to these people and to experts that, that have the expertise and um, to enable you to build a sustainable business for your company. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how do you think um, the, uh, to tie it back to, to the creative industry, um, what can be the role of agencies in, in, in the process of, of um, consulting clients? How open are they? Like, this question goes to you too. And so, from from my perspective, um, creative agencies are always a kind of trendsetter. They they see the trends, they feel mm -hmm. the trends, they are part of the trend. <laughs> and what companies um, believe is, if if a creative agency or a creative director is telling them about people want to see they, the the society is uh, moving into that direction, whatever. Mm -hmm. These are the, um, uh, the trends. Um, this is how you could influence a market mm -hmm. here. <laughs> you, know? mm -hmm. you could maybe set trends in these companies um, because mo most of the marketers, they, they are feeling more comfortable to do the same job as the la in the past. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be bold, only a few of them. So mm -hmm. if, if, you, if they have strong creative people at their side, that could uh, help them to be also bold. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. from your perspective, you, you're nodding. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with everything that she said. Um, and um, so the the question was about how how brands or how companies can change to be more sustainable, or uh, like like how agencies, what what their role can be, oh, yeah. uh, can they influence basically the, the brand by being a sustainable creative agency, or like yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it's um, really interesting. We were recently doing some uh, research on um, innovation, mm -hmm. how aesthetics can 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 push innovation forward, um, and the role of the artist in all of that. Mm -hmm. So you know, we can translate that in general to the role of, you know, the creative person. And if you look at all of the innovations and all of the great developments, um, 
you know, whether it be technological or cultural or something like that, it often started with an artist or a creative idea mm -hmm. um, who brought two different things together that didn't match. Um, you know, one uh, exciting or, or one of the favorite examples in Germany would be, uh, or, you know, in the electric music scene would be like Kraftwerk, for example, right? So, you know, <laughs> computers or computer sounds and music used to not have anything to do with each other, but then they <laughs> brought them together and that actually changed the entire industry. That was a madman. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I mean, even if you look at sci-fi, um, you know, a lot of the ideas that um, you read in sci-fi novels or you know, see in even some of the sci-fi uh, series from the 50s and 60s, you know, some of those ideas actually were you know, they became a part of our culture, they were planted in our minds, and they um, gave us ideas about things that uh, were possible at the time. But um, you could say that, you know, art, uh, you know, actually sort of guided technology, sometimes technology yeah. guides art. Um, and so in that sense, the role that an agency can play, I mean, with creativity, with creative ideas, you can actually challenge. And sometimes it's al almost easier to challenge norms if you put it in sort of an artistic package. Mm -hmm. And you're allowed to be crazy, you're allowed to be bold, and you're allowed to challenge as an agency um, existing structures. Because a lot of times, uh, in my experience, we've uh, spoken to uh, clients, clients as in people who work for you know large companies, manage brands, and they personally, they really want to change. They're, the individuals that you talk to are actually really very visionary. And they sometimes feel caught in the corporate structures that mm -hmm. they have to exist within. And they need help from external organizations like agencies, like sometimes artists, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, corporations I've seen, you know, they pull actually artists directly in to hold workshops or to just advise them um, um, and give them ideas as to how they can sort of, you know, break free from the silos that they're in. And sometimes you can act as a mediator and not only inspire, mm -hmm. but also help them with their internal communication. Um, and um, if you look at um, you know the, the innovation curve, so to speak, um, getting back to the research that, that we've been recently been doing, um, that's a model that's actually um, seen quite a bit in innovation, the sort of innovation curve where it, it, an idea starts normally um, uh, in a niche group or in, a, in, this, in subculture or um, it's a small group of people just sort of experimenting with things. And it's often, like I said, it's kind of like an outsider. So as an agency, you have the advantage of the outsider, you know, you are in a way kind of like in a niche, and um, you have the freedom to, to challenge and come up with um, ideas. You have the freedom to put two or three different things that may not fit to fit to each other and come up with something completely new. And that's going to be something that you know, like I said, it starts from some you know niche uh, organization, some niche group, and then um, if it's the right idea, then it will take flight. It'll become mainstream. Um, and uh, be adapted and adopted and, and absorbed by mainstream culture, be mm -hmm. used by a lot of people until basically um, it you know, goes through its life cycle, maybe becomes irrelevant, maybe it plateaus and stays relevant for a while, or it dies back down and then the next innovation comes. And like I said, quite often uh, cycles of innovations are started by, by artists. So mm -hmm. I really think that you know, agencies should challenge, but also um, you know, consult as well and think about the long-term um, journey as well. Um, I think it's interesting, um, we were talking, or I think you mentioned that um, people were talking about sustainability quite a bit um, before, during the pandemic, now not so much. And we have to really keep an eye on that because I think um, that could be something that's good and maybe also something that's bad at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's bad if we've forgotten about sustainability, if we've forgotten about our purpose and the impact and our footprint that we have on the world as individuals or as companies. Um, but it might be good because sustainability might have become a hygiene factor. Because if you look at how some of cor the corporations and companies have developed and some of the brands, they've put out a sustainable product range or they have launched a sustainable brand or they've purchased a sustainable um, uh, uh, um, company or they've launched some sort of sustainable um, uh, technology mm -hmm. and they've been communicating that sort of like as a separate communication pillar but realize that this is something that's actually a given and ex expected by yeah. Gen Z and uh, uh, mainstream uh, society as well slowly people I mean people are starting really to make purchase decisions according to whether something is sustainable and that has come from societal pressure that's actually been led by Gen Z you know mm -hmm. they like I said they don't buy anything that doesn't align with their personal values with how they see the future of the world and how they think society should be run today. So that's something that, you know, it, I think it's probably a double-edged sword. I think, you know, it's both bad and good <laughs> that we're not talking about sustainability as much because I think some 
brands are trying to turn sustainability into mm -hmm. kind of a hygiene factor because it's not necessarily a core of their brand or part of their core communication. Mm -hmm. For some it is. Um, and that's also something that you know we consult brands on as well. You know, how much of sustainability is a part of your core brand? How much is, is it a hygiene factor? When how does much it make, should it be? Right, how much should it be? <laughs> how much you, should you communicate it? Um, we're not talking about how much you should be it. We're saying always, you should always have a 100% sustainable core mm -hmm. whenever possible and always strive mm -hmm. for that at a minimum. Because we also say when we're talking to brands, you know, if you're going to talk the talk, you have to walk the walk mm -hmm. long before you start talking the talk. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, Zagi, you were also nodding all the way. Um, <laughs> I'm going a bit back to, to the um, creative part of that about um, the clash of different things. How open is, like in your experience, the music world and also like the university world for creative solutions? Like uh, Kimberly mentioned Kraftwerk, which was like music, computers, how could you even combine that? Is In, in my perception, I would think classical music, they are not open for changes. That's very interesting what you say because uh, maybe one of the things that don't really change is classical music <laughs> and classical musicians. So whatever you do and you perform in front of them, they will expect the old stars and, and the more uh, authentic things. Mm -hmm. But you know, you have uh, Pink Black, whatever the, the group, am I saying it right? And they took the, uh, one of the Paganini violin concerto, the final movement, and they make a song out of it. And uh, who would ever thought so that now youngsters that never probably had in their lives Paganini uh, violin concerto final movement, which is the campanella, yeah, the bells and sing, suddenly will <laughs> sing uh, Pink Black with it. So a lot of things happen like that. And it, uh, with classical music, it happens all the time with Mozart on mobile phones and other things. But in the business industry and education industry, because uh, I'm dealing with business and education at the same time, uh, changes are, uh, are actually welcome because mm -hmm. you need to be very creative sometimes to find solutions. And uh, via creative mind, I think people with creativity able to be better uh, managers because they see things from a different angle, from a, um, a bit more horizontal level. So, you know, uh, many things that uh, some people go follow the operation books and they want to follow it in the right way. Sometimes you, you're saying, okay, there, there is this way, but we also need to think about the consumer and uh, also the reputation and also the, 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 the partners and the environment. And we need to think in, in how to approach it in a complete different manner. And, and they don't want to make the change. And, and luckily, if you are the leader, you can force that uh, on them because then you come and, and try to explain how to gain the maximum positivity uh, for an mm -hmm. outcome, not always in the simple, straightforward way, which is usually also very painful and not so positive. And I think you see these days people who has a experience and study music in their life or other things in the creative are taking more and more position of CEOs. I don't saying that it's a guarantee for every musician now to become <laughs> a CEO, but <laughs> uh, you definitely see uh, more <laughs> vice chancellors and poor vice chancellors in UK universities and others who has backgrounds in arts. And, and our leading teams, and they found the very interesting commercial solutions for issues, how to uh, find ideas when, when one channel is blocked or you see the change of regulation and put an end, they found another channel open mm. and they found where the gap and sometimes where the gap, they come up with another idea and uh, they're listening more than to be in themselves. They're listening what the market wants. Yeah. What the, the more sensitivity. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they are more accessible in a way to ideas. Mm -hmm. And then they get the idea and then they create out of it something completely new. So there is no, no such a thing that, uh, in my opinion, that, you know, looking at the, the music or the art industry, maybe not always is so flexible sometimes, yeah, because mm -hmm. Some people think that they need to see certain things and nothing else will be acceptable. But 
by using some kind of um, very much discipline. And this is what people forgetting, that art is a very disciplined thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it allows you then to be able to be more flexible when you do business. Yeah. So that's Absolutely. Like, I like your, your tech on discipline, because you have to discipline yourself to continue. Yes. Like you said, you, you exercised your cello over and you over again. You can repeat the same passage zillions of times. And, and that's the way of life. And, and some people are not able to f be focused to that extreme. Mm -hmm. And also the way that, you, you know, as a musician you sit and you need to tune yourself. As a soloist you tune harder, like a stronger sound. And as a chamber musician, a bit lower. And as an orchestra, lower. Mm -hmm. And you so when you are in a group of people, you need also to tune yourself. You cannot yeah, you just be loud to all the to the time. others. And in a way, yes. Uh, you need to listen to the others and yourself. You know, in music. Yeah. That's the unique yeah. thing. Yeah. And That's you true. need, and many times you cannot talk. <laughs> because not everyone are opera singers, true? So you need <laughs> to, you look at them. And while they look, you understand. You know, many times I sat in my office with people and, and it was a very difficult moment where I knew something that they didn't know, mm -hmm. that I know. And I know that a sentence or word by a member of staff to someone else can end up really bad. Yeah. Mm. But you cannot say it. And, and you're just sitting there and you learn how to divert the discussion to the direction you want by uh, forcing it in a very creative way to another direction. And this is the same in business, when someone does sales, when someone does marketing, when someone wants attention as a lecturer. This ability, I think creative people has it in a more natural way. Mm -hmm. Other people learning it. But there is another thing. Not everyone can be creative. You need some talents too. So at and the education. end of the day, it's two for us. Like, yeah. Exactly. Uh, like uh, Albert Einstein said, like creativity is education or intellect having fun. <laughs> so you, you cannot be super creative if you have no knowledge. Yeah. What new... Because it's like, like we have said, like, like parts of your brain connecting things that haven't been connected yet. And if there is nothing, nothing can be Look, connected. Look, many times <laughs> when I talk to staff, uh, you know, I, uh, part of my role, you, you talk to a lot of people. And, and, uh, and this is something really exciting for me that uh, I can gain some ideas and then suddenly I see it. And I say something and probably I will give 10 different orders at the same time. So a part of my assistant who will go ballistic completely and need to find a way to chase that, some other people also finding it quite difficult and demanding to follow up so fast. But then I, I cannot stop, so I give X, Y, Z, and at the same time, completely three different subjects, completely different uh, occasions and different uh, directions. But it comes out in, uh, in, in a very creative way where I'm thinking, these are the solutions and now we need to go and do it. And, and uh, some people will think he's mental, why is he doing that, this? That's like a conductor in, in front exactly. of the orchestra, right? Exactly, yeah. but, but you know, there are no sometimes the right ways mm -hmm. to del deliver your ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes uh, you mentioned a conductor. Did you know that majority of musicians don't need a conductor? I know. I, 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 is, I, yeah. is there usually to say, start and finish. But <laughs> at the end of the day, musicians don't really need, a professional musician don't need really a conductor. They can, the Berliner Philharmonica, I can guarantee you now, don't need a conductor ever. They have the concertmaster and they have the musician and they're all listening and looking. But conductor is the ones who sometimes come and interpret the composer in a different way. And, and here is the same. Everyone can be a CEO, but not everyone can be a successful CEO. Yeah. <laughs> and to, be a, a, to, to see the mood where it's going, that's the hardest thing. That's true. I think these are nice words to, to end our talk for now. We, we are way over time. Uh, it's been really nice having you here, everyone. Um, I think we will continue uh, the discussion later this evening. Um, I'm really thankful that uh, for everyone that, that tuned in and um, I hope to see everyone in the next Café Artistic. Um, yeah, and thanks again for everyone. Thank Have a you. nice evening. Thank uh, you.
have a nice evening as well and uh, thanks a lot for the guest to host us again and hopefully see you next time. <laughs>